So hello, everybody, and welcome. And thank you for joining us today for this virtual event. My name is Antoine Varania, and I will be your host for today's presentation. Today, we are talking about detection and characterization of single silicone quantum dot and single biomolecule. I am joined today by the speaker, Professor Jean Linros, Professor in Solid State Electronics at the Department of Applied Physics at KTH Stockholm. Uh, Jan Linros um, received Jan his PhD in uh, physics from Chalmers uh, back in 1986. Uh, in 1993, he accepted a position at Royal uh, Institute of Technology and is now heading the Photonic Research Unit. He is an active teacher in the nanoelectronics nanotechnology and has supervised over 15 PhD students and has published uh, over 250 scientific papers and has taken part in uh, around 50 invited talks. He is also the co-founder of a company called Syntex, developing imaging X-ray detectors, and a, of a company Spin Y, developing an electron spin filter. His current research interests include silicon nanostructure, such as silicon quantum dots nanowires for biomolecule sensing, nanopores for studies of single molecule translocations. A main scientific breakthrough has been photoluminescent spectroscopy of individual silicon quantum dots. So welcome, Jen. Just as a little housekeeping before we get started. You have all joined this presentation in listening mode only. If you have any question during the presentation, please type them in the question box in the control panel as we go along. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Now, without further ado, I will hand over to Professor Linros. Professor Linros, over to you. Thank you, um, uh, Antoine, and thank you very much for uh, the presentation for, for me. And welcome to this uh, talk then that I will give on silicon quantum dots and the physics of that, and the let's say the the story, the history of it, <clears throat> which has now been around for like thirty years. So. Uh, <clears throat> It's a very interesting topic, in fact. What you see on the first screen here is actually uh, some uh, electron beam lithography made uh, silicon structures. And in the beginning, we tried to do uh, silicon quantum dots by simply lithography and etching, oxidation, and so on. And what you see here is something I, I put in like, uh, this is a very random process and sometimes you might get uh, nanocrystals that are so small that they, they could luminesce. <clears throat> and my main collaborators are here. And <clears throat> on the next slide is uh, lots of people who have passed uh, my laboratory. So Ilyas Ushugo, is the first that characterized single uh, dot luminescence. He's still with us. Federico Pevere is out the industry now, but he was very essential to much of the characterization. Chin Yang Su is, is a new uh, PhD student. He's in the lab right now. <clears throat> we have some alumni students, uh, Mata, Benjamin, Chuan Juan, uh, Anna Fuchikova, who was a postdoc, Alexander Marinins. We have collaboration with chemical synthesis with uh, uh, Jonathan Veno and uh, Kevin. Uh, we worked much together with John Valenta's group in Prague. And on the theory side, we have uh, Jim Vey Lu and Alex Sumer. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so this is um, the outline of my presentation. So we'll have some introduction. Uh, I will go into quickly experimental single dot spectroscopy, uh, which is our, our great interest <clears throat> to probe the physics of quantum dots. I'll show spectra and absorption spectra. I show blinking, recombination, 
and uh, some work on X-ray hardness and new structures with polymers. And I will simply give you a very little glimpse of, of what we're doing with the same setup uh, to probe exosomes. Uh, so let's start with the introduction. <clears throat> So I'm sure you've seen uh, photos like this. They are all over the place when you talk about, about nanoscience. And what you see is quantum dot emission from cadmium selenide nanocrystals. So they are the same except for the size, which vary from small to large on the scale of a few nanometers like that. And what you see here is emission when they are irradiated with the UV lamp. So they em emit their sort of their band gap luminescence. And this is called uh, quantum confinement, that, which is a quantum mechanical uh, feature that when you reduce the size, um, energy levels uh, grow, uh, go away from each other and you get uh, <clears throat> a higher, higher emission energy. The same thing happens in absorption. And you can see here that as you go from the bulk band gap, <clears throat> and uh, and diminish the nanocrystals, the absorption edge then is shifted to higher and higher energies. Um, <clears throat> so what about silicon then? Well, silicon unfortunately has an indirect band gap, um, <clears throat> which is shown here. I'm, I'm not sure that you can see my, my uh, pointer here. But anyway, if you look to the, the middle image, we can see that the uh, uh, <clears throat> conduction and valence band do not line up. Therefore, to, to have such a uh, recombination event, uh, that there must be uh, <clears throat> a photon coming out and a, a photon takes up the momentum. That's not the case in gallium arsenide and other direct band gap semiconductors. And that's why they are used for LEDs and uh, light sources in general, whereas silicon has been very poor in that aspect. Um, <clears throat> now, in 1990, uh, Lee Cannon discovered that when he had etched uh, silicon samples um, using electrochemical etching in an um, HF solution, he found that immediately after they became very luminescent, and here he's sh he shining uh, from a UV lamp, and it gives out uh, luminescence, the silicon wafer here. And so the, uh, the, the structure here is porous, and the more he etched, and the longer he etched, the more porosity he got on his samples, and the, the, uh, the higher the energy of the emission, or shorter wavelength on that scale. And they managed to show that this luminescence really comes from the small nanostructures that you can see here on the TEM image. Um, <clears throat> so that was like 30 years ago, and it started off a big hype in, in uh, <clears throat> among many researchers. It was almost like the high temperature superconductors, which came uh, three years earlier. And a lot of people got into this, also because it was so easy to, to make these uh, uh, samples that luminous. And nowadays the, uh, the interest has faded as with many uh, new things. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, people later on, um, porous silicon is a very complicated structure so uh, many people did instead silicon nanocrystals and it turned out that they, they could give the same kind of luminescence. And here is a, a, a nanocrystals, here is a TEM of a nanocrystal where you can clearly see the, the, <clears throat> the edges of the, the planes and it's covered by an oxide here. This one is quite big, so it will not luminesce in the visible range. So when you have, if you have H porous silicon, for instance, or silicon nanocrystals in, in, in HF to take off the oxide, you will be left with uh, nanocrystals that have a passivated by hydrogen. 
but they can also be passivated by oxide or by organic ligands or organic cells or anything else. And of course, this has a huge influence on, on the physics and the emission. <clears throat> so the open questions that, that we um, put up then at the beginning when, when this porous silicon was discovered, so there was a huge debate whether this was a really quantum confinement emission from pure silicon quantum dots, or whether it came from some kind of chemi chemist, um, chemistry on the, on the surface of, of, these, of the porous silicon. Tuning, can you, could you go all over the visible spectrum? How about the line width? Well, as I showed you on the spectra, they are very broad. So is, is this a feature of it, or is it just that it's in homogeneous broadening because we're sampling many different sizes at the same time? Is it a direct band gap that we got? <clears throat> Quantum efficiency, can that be very high? Um, <clears throat> can you reach high excitation? Can one have gain? So those were very interesting questions. <clears throat> that we also set up to, to try to measure, to, to get uh, <clears throat> to probe experimentally. Now, our main challenge is here is that the radiate lifetime of silicon nanocrystals has been found to be 10 to 100 microseconds, while that of, of direct pan gap quantum dots is only some nanoseconds. So the difference is, is huge. And experimentally, that means that your experiment will be much longer if you want to probe uh, a single quantum dot and, and, and uh, <clears throat> detect the same amount of photons. So let's say if you do one day of experiments in, <clears throat> uh, on, on the direct panel quantum dot, if you do that on our silicon quantum dots, would take maybe 10 years to probably the same thing, get the same number of photons. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a photo that we took when, when I started uh, this with <clears throat> the master student uh, in 1994, I guess. And this is the wafer is still less, it's a four inch wafer. It's compared to here to cadmium selenide uh, nanocrystals, which are dispersed in a toluene solution. And remarkably, what you can see here, the, uh, the intensity, so <clears throat> they're excited by U with M, intensity are almost the same. And that's because the, the quantum efficiency is probably something like 10%, and it's a similar uh, here. Um, <clears throat> So let's come then to the experimental section and show how we do the single dot spectroscopy. And I, elaborate, I will elaborate this a little bit more than usual because uh, <clears throat> this is uh, Andor uh, seminar. So <clears throat> I'll show and, and uh, in fact, we devoted uh, the, the, the photoluminescence system uh, simply to get the most uh, <clears throat> to get, uh, yes, most advantages when probing silicon quantum dots. But first, how do we make uh, silicon quantum dots? I showed you in the first slide that we started off by, by lithography. So here's one of our first samples that were made by uh, e-beam lithography, plasma etching, what you see here. And then what you can do with silicon is that you can shrink the silicon core by by <clears throat> oxidation that's shown on, on image B here. And then you can <clears throat> uh, remove the oxide and you can shrink it once again. And eventually you can reach structures like this, what you see here in, in a TM photograph and <clears throat> where, where there can be a, a little quantum dot. Um, <clears throat> So if the structure doesn't luminesce, you go back and you make, <coughs> you repeat steps three and four here, oxidation and, uh, and uh, removal of oxide. Later we found that also walls can be used and there the chances to, to see uh, luminescence was uh, much higher 
because the the yeah it's still a random process where where somewhere you could have um, a quantum dot something like shown here on this tm and yes here is a tm of of one of the pillars but this is still not at the size and would have to be shrunken once again and what we used was then non-uniform oxidation where because of the high curvature here at the top, it would oxidize slower than the pillar. So in the next step, one could you see that, that the, the pillar would be gone and you're left with a, a top uh, nanocrystal. Later on, we have also used uh, SY wafers. So we have a top uh, device layer, like uh, something like 60 nanometers or so, and we do plasma thinning here. And we go all the way to the down to the oxide, but stop there. And occasionally, we will have uh, some left planes of uh, some left uh, thin films of uh, silicon left. And then we do a rapid thermal oxidation and look for PL. <clears throat> Here's a cross section of such a sample where you see in a nanocrystal here. This is our uh, uh, schematic of our photoluminescence setup. And uh, we have an inverted microscope lenses here. And the sample is placed here. It's excited by lasers. Uh, usually we use this for silicon nanocrystals. Um, so it can be directed through the lens system here, but it can also be from the side here to allow dark field imaging. The luminescence comes out and it goes into a spectrometer here and comes out on a CCD camera. Both these are from Andor, by the way. Uh, there we do have an avalanche photo detector as well here. And I'll show a small uh, video now of uh, uh, <clears throat> how the system looks like to get give you an idea of that and hopefully so this is our micro photoluminescence uh, system that we use for uh, uh, probing the photoluminescence of single uh, uh, objects, single uh, particles. So here we have an inverted uh, microscope, size microscope. When we have uh, mounted uh, the sample on top, so the sample is upside down. And then we have different objective lenses uh, depending on the on the uh, how uh, much we, we want to zoom in the, in the sample. Then we have mounted also an avalanche uh, photo detector for uh, uh, time resolved measurements. And on the back of the microscope we have uh, two uh, lasers that can uh, excite uh, the sample either through the lens or uh, from uh, the outside. So now of course we don't see anything because the laser is off. But if we switch on the laser so we start exciting uh, uh, the nanocrystals, then we are going to uh, see the photoluminescence of, uh, of a single uh, uh, nanocrystal, cadmium selenide nanocrystal that are on, the, on a silicon chip, and we can also see that uh, they are blinking, so they switch uh, on and off, as you can clearly see. For example, now the dot is on, but now it's off again, and so on. So if we reach... Okay, so that was just uh, <clears throat> a visit in our lab, let's say. At the time, we were probing uh, cadmium selenide and crystals. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, to show a little more of our system, here is uh, what uh, Federico showed. Uh, this is the spectrometer, and note here the, the long tube that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, converts the image from the microscope here and going through um, <clears throat> the spectrometer is from the side. We can also have a cryostat sitting on top here. Uh, we have also a uh, Hamamatsu CMS camera now, which was uh, later on. We can move the sample by motors and so on. In here are the uh, essential parts then our system. We also do, uh, do have a uh, uh, an AFM sitting on top here from JPK Instruments. And <clears throat> so one, that allows to, to have both 
to to correlate uh, photoluminescence, mic microluminescence images with AFM images. Um, <clears throat> Yes, this is our Andor camera. It's cooled to minus uh, 100 centigrade and it can stay open for an hour without any, uh, <clears throat> uh, virtually no uh, noise background. The CMOS camera can go up to much, uh, much higher frequencies, uh, about one kilohertz. We also have an avalanche photo detector and we finally found one that had very low background counts, which is only a couple per seconds, which is very important because on the right hand side you see the text here, the, uh, have the levels when you look at single silicon quantum dots is very low, so if you get 10 to 20 photons you're lucky. The spectrometer, since we knew that, that the spectra are quite broad, we thought we could have a small spectrometer, but somebody guided us that uh, a large spectrometer is better for imaging. And here you can see that imaging is quite good. This is a sample with, with pits etched in silicon, and, and the pitch distance is four microns. In, and if I zoom in here on that image, I see that I have an optical, uh, like the normal optical resolution of half a micron or something like that. And moreover, even though the camera, if, if we put it right at the microscope or we put it at the end of the large spectrometer, we only lose about 30% of, of uh, photons. Um, <clears throat> okay. So here we go now for imaging silicon quantum dots in, in, uh, in, in uh, thin film. So this is a white light image. Um, here is a photoluminescence image with the Andor camera. Here is a photoluminescence color image with a color camera from the microscope. At the, at the bottom on the left, uh, <clears throat> you see uh, the, uh, um, yes, the same PL image enlarged and what we do is we 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 image like this and then we put down the slits on the spectrometer and now we see that only a few uh, are, are confined in the slit and then we turn in uh, uh, <clears throat> a grating and then this axis is, is converted to wavelengths instead and you can see here is a spectrum then from a single dot Probing luminescence and absorption. <clears throat> so, of course, in the beginning, we, we had a very broad spectra, but finally, now we have been able to, to uh, uh, make very good uh, samples and, and improve our imaging. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this was many years ago by now. So, here's a typical spectrum from a single silicon quantum dot taken at 12 kelvins. You see a very sharp peak in the beginning here, and we interpret that this is the no phono line, and here is probably a TO phono line. And if you probe <clears throat> several dots, the the distance between those two lines is is uh, plotted here, which is about sixty milli electron volts, which which is known uh, TO phono uh, <clears throat> distance in in, in silicon. So therefore, we can also conclude that, yes, this is really coming from silicon, uh, <clears throat> like quantum dot luminescence. We also have other features here, um, and acoustic phonons maybe, and this we interpret as, as a breathing or stretching mode. So this is the silicon nanocrystals, which is vibrating as a whole like that. To, uh, <clears throat> to really see a sharp spectra, one has to be careful about spectral diffusion. And here's, uh, here's some images <coughs> uh, taken in, cons in a sequence after one another. And, <coughs> you, and you see that the spectra then slightly uh, moves to the left or the right, which is also visible from these uh, two frames here. 
So in order to get a very sharp spectrum, one, one must look for peaks that where spectral diffusion is, is negligible. And finally, this is the sharpest spectrum that we have observed. And now we're down to 250 micro electron volts, which is actually the resolution of our spectrometer. <clears throat> and we see that we are now uh, coming close to what, what can be observed for other systems. Um, <clears throat> so we're at 250 and, and we should know then that this is set by the resolution of the system. Unfortunately, um, later we have been able to make uh, nice samples by by annealing at a rather high temperature, like 1100 centigrade, to form a, a very good oxide. And and here a set of spectra that we've taken then showing really that uh, the photoluminescence is like like the poor silicon here. We can tune it from from 650 nanometers up to 900 or something like that and the very sharp spectra all over the place. So how can we understand this uh, <coughs> emission then? Do we have a direct band gap? Well, not really, because the lifetimes are still uh, very long. But uh, the way to interpret it is to use Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. And it, it, it says that if you have a very small, delta x, then your uncertainty in delta p <coughs> uh, must be rather large. So the <coughs> uh, so uh, in, in k space, then we will have a broadening of, of both the, uh, the whole um, um, <coughs> emission, uh, the whole band and, and the conduction band like this. And maybe uh, probably you have some in a quasi direct recombination among the wings of these two uh, <coughs> these two spectra. This is how inter so the, the it's quasi direct uh, emission. And indeed, the the other alternative, the phonon line, is uh, mostly very weak, and sometimes it's not observed at all. There were some previous measurements by, by Kovale demonstrating in 1999 that one really saw uh, the phonon lines. And at that time, it was interpreted that, that all of the emission is using phonons. But in our measurements, we can see that, yes, there are phonon emission lines as well, but the no phonon line is a dominating one. Going now to more uh, detailed physics, uh, the silicon is, is um, <coughs> silicon quantum dots is quite complicated because you you have uh, the several uh, valleys in the conduction band. Here are calculations uh, by atomic calculations by the group of uh, Jun Bei Lu and Alex Sunger of uh, the, the states in silicon, and they indicate the, the possible transmissions here. And here's a calculated spec spectrum, absorption spectrum of uh, silicon quantum dot of two nanometer size. Here's the luminescent state, and then really the absorption builds up here when you come to higher energies. We set out to probe that, and uh, we uh, what you see here is an absorption spectrum on that side, but we also show the emission spectrum of a single nanocrystals, and this is taken at 70 Kelvin. We had only a rather broad uh, lamp, which uh, we could uh, run through a spectrometer, giving us uh, like five nanometers uh, width. And indeed, the uh, absorption builds up here, and it has some features here, which we can resolve in like four peaks in the absorption band. And when we, uh, <clears throat> when we compare with the calculated spectrum from, from uh, uh, Sumer's group, Sumer and Jim Belou, they have calculated for a three nanometer, nanometer silicon nanocrystal, we can see that, yes, this uh, peak would be at least um, uh, <clears throat> these transitions, while the, the following peak here would be that. And then we come up further into the, uh, actually, the direct band of silicon later on. 
So we can really can see some features of, of, uh, of the states that are acting here. The, the absorption is, is in, <clears throat> very close to the emission band, is very low, and we cannot really see it. Here are also some, some calculations where they show that <clears throat> where <clears throat> the, uh, the transitions appear, uh, they're combined of, uh, of uh, <clears throat> phonon state, phonon emission, but also some, some direct band gap uh, recombination. And that builds up towards higher uh, energies here. So there is an intermixing. And probably the, uh, the higher states then in the intermixing, they have a, a shorter lifetime or, <clears throat> and, and therefore uh, <clears throat> we observe that predominantly. Blinking. <clears throat> um, yes, so um, unfortunately, the movie cannot be shown here because this is not a, a live presentation, but I will take, uh, I will show you, hopefully, hopefully you can see that this is a, a blinking movie of uh, silicon nanocrystals. And we have characterized that here with our system. And uh, then we can, with the under camera, we can come down to, to frames like uh, maybe 10 milliseconds or so. And you see blinking plots, traces here from a single dots uh, in, in the B here below silicon, that's for silicon. And as you see, when you go up in excitation power, the blinking is more frequent. But you can clearly see that, that there is uh, uh, two states here in the blinking. We have compared also the cadmium selenide with our same system, just to, uh, to be able to, to, um, <coughs> to compare it identically. And let's see now. Yes, and here we plot from our, one of our publications the on and off time distribution. So this is statistics for, for the how long the dots are on and how long they are off. And for cadmium selenide, we, we get what everybody else sees is the power dependence. So the on times and off times are characterized by a power law with exponent roughly 1.3 actually. While with the silicon nanocrystals, you see that we have the same logarithm log scale here, but here is a linear scale. So, and we can fit this with lines. So they, the distribution is exponential here. <coughs> and uh, it can be interpreted as, as um, what well, I'll show you in the next slide. The most simple interpretation is that there are traps at the surface and if it's uh, oxide covered, it's easy to, uh, <coughs> it's well known that, that the oxide contains traps that can take up an electron. And when the electron sits there, when you excite the next electron group pair, next exciton, you will have Auger recombination and, and uh, thus the nanocrystal will be dark. And then eventually the electron comes back and the, it's restored again. Um, <clears throat> recombination. So, um, <clears throat> so in, in a bulk semiconductor, uh, recombination is usually by defects or deep, or deep levels. And a uh, recombination event, then electron has to uh, diffuse until it finds that defect and the hole comes along and, and there's a, so that takes some time. In a nanocrystal, if you would have a defect nearby, that would lead to instant uh, <clears throat> recombination. Um, so what is radiative, not radiative recombination in the silicon nanocrystal? Well, this is a, a very old uh, measurement that was done in 1993, showing photoluminescence from porous silicon. So here, the photoluminescence uh, at low uh, temperature, at room, when we start on the left, uh, <clears throat> then after, directly after etching, the porous silicon is covered by uh, uh, hydrogen. 
So <clears throat> while when you when it's heated up by oxidation, um, <clears throat> the the hydrogen leaves and you're left with a lot of dangling bonds that uh, corresponds to a high spin density, what they measured here, and the photoluminescence goes to zero. While when you keep oxidizing at higher temperature, you build up an oxide which uh, provides uh, surface um, <coughs> passivation. So uh, in other words, you would say that these are dark nanocrystals and, and those are bright and those are possibly also bright. We have measured that. So here are two uh, decays from two individual dots. We measured several, and you see a large variation in the photoluminescence lifetime. When you put it together, you see actually that uh, if you put all these, you see that uh, corresponds to a, <clears throat> a stretch exponential, which, which is usually observed for, for ensemble measurements. <clears throat> now, what we thought of here was that that a defect in the somewhere in the nanocrystals would be uh, then the nanocrystal would simply become dark and <clears throat> so we were thinking instead of uh, now it's not shown here here's a movie otherwise of, of blinking and <clears throat> this blinking what we observe here corresponds to well some distance in nanometers then and, and this is tunneling by electrons to, to that uh, uh, <clears throat> site. But when you look at uh, summing all the uh, images here, you will see that <clears throat> there are some very bright ones and there are some gray level ones and so on. And, <clears throat> and maybe one could say that, yes, the blinking that we see, the blue line over here, that's totally set by our, our uh, setup and what we can detect. Remember, I said that we can maybe, for the silicon nanocrystals, we can see down to 10 milliseconds uh, frame rate. But maybe there are a blinking on, uh, on a much higher frequency, and those we could never see, and those can maybe uh, give the, uh, these gray nanocrystals and correspond to the variation in lifetimes that we see. So we model this and we, we then suppose that we have bright nanocrystals, we have dark, and we have this possibility of blinking. We call it rapid blinking. And we uh, exclude this possibility, which others believe that there is a recombination uh, at a defect state or in. So we, we <coughs> We prefer not to take that into account, and we, we believe we can explain all, all of, of the non-radiative recommendation by this model. And that is shown here, the model, and uh, I'll present it a little bit. So if you have a blinking, now if you excite an nanocrystal, what you first would see then, if, if the, this is a, a short time um, <clears throat> pulse, so you would see an initial decay related to transfer to traps, and then they, uh, the uh, electrons might come back to the nanocrystals, and then you see delayed luminescence when carriers come back. And such a transient we, we were able to observe here, and we could fit it with the model, with, which is the red line here. <clears throat> the blue are the, are the data for, for that transient. Another prediction is that <clears throat> if we, uh, if we excite with continuous excitation uh, because of the um, <clears throat> transfer to traps, there will be a, a non-radiative recombination, so it will be more dim. And that will only happen and we will see, at low uh, excitations, you will not see it because they, it will come back. But <clears throat> at higher pumping, uh, you will you will see a loss here, and that's exactly what we can see here. So the the green line is showing oxide passivated nanocrystals, and we see a big loss here compared to a sample which is in the toluene, which which doesn't have an oxide and where there is no traps and it has very high quantum efficiency. Can also explain the uh, the 
with a well-known fact that when you go to higher temperatures, the luminescence is diminished. And this is simply but by the broadening of the state at higher temperatures, then we lead to that more traps can be reached by, by the electrons. Finally, we looked for by excitons, and, and here are some spectra and at higher pumping, and we didn't, uh, we could not see any peak for the for the by exciton, which is frequently observed when you pump the red band gap uh, quantum dots, like in your phosphide. However, in the case, we, we could uh, see some something from by exciton, in that if if you excite higher than 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 the threshold of one one <clears throat> excitation per nanocrystal, then you can see <clears throat> some some initial transient here, and those are the lifetime we extracted from those from that. Um, I think I'm running um, short in time here, so I will go quicker over the last uh, images here. Here's shown a peculiar thing about silicon nanocrystals, and that is that if you expose them to uh, uh, X-ray radiation, <clears throat> nothing happens actually. We see the individual quantum dots here, even at very high uh, uh, doses of X-ray radiation, whereas cadmium selenide, which we compared to already at quite low uh, levels, they, they get destroyed. And, and this is a plot then of the absorbed dose in, in kilograms here, indicating that. So the, the silicon nanocrystals are very stable once they're formed. Lately, uh, many groups have come to uh, chemical synthesis of, of uh, nanocrystals. And, <clears throat> and that goes out from hydrogen synthesis kyoxane. And this is a <clears throat> material compound which has, uh, let's say, too much uh, oxygen and or, or too much silicon. And then, when you need at high temperature, the the extra silicon precipitates out. You can dissolve the uh, oxide by HF, and then the nanocrystals can uh, become dispersed in total. Later on, you can. Uh, <coughs> You can passivate them with uh, uh, ligands, and typically we have been doing that with the dodecene. And interestingly, uh, the, the quantum efficiency here can be very high, and we, we have experienced <coughs> samples which go up to 70% uh, quantum efficiency in, in the liquid here. We also managed to put them into uh, <coughs> into uh, polymers. And what you see here is a white light image of some polymers. And here's with the UV excitation. You can clearly see the different <coughs> colors here. And the blue, we, we're not sure of, but, but these red ones are certainly from, from silicon nanocrystals, um, <coughs> quantum dots. We can, you can also put the, the polymer onto a glass wafer. And here you see that, yes, you can see through that glass wafer. <clears throat> the polymer with the nanocrystals takes <clears throat> takes some of the UV light that we shine here, but and that is then uh, transferred to the edges here by by multiple reflections inside the glass. And this can be used as a solar concentrator, and <clears throat> where you take out uh, a just a small fraction of the light is channeled out and we, you have PVs at the edges of, of the windows like that. And Ilya Sushugo in, in our group is, is working on that. And he's managed now to come up to a power efficiency of, of uh, one or two percent. We also used uh, put uh, quantum dots in, in transparent woods, which is something they, they do here. I will simply jump over it because I'm short of time. And maybe I should also um, just flash up in, in another project. I've, I've included this because it doesn't belong to the story of the silicon quantum dot, but uh, it's a nice uh, way we can use uh, the Photoluminescent system, and here are, are 
And so we do have a, a project with exosomes. Exosomes are vesicles that are emitted by cells. We want to use them to try to probe cancer. So we're collaborating with the, the <coughs> Karolinska Institute here in Stockholm on, on that. Here are some exosomes shown, and they are typically like 100 nanometer like that. And they have surface protein that you can probe with the antibodies. And with our photomedicine system, we, we can have the AFM here, and we can look at the fluorescence emitted in the microscope. And <clears throat> we can probe that with different type of, of uh, fluorescent markers attached to, to, to different antibodies. Um, <clears throat> and here are some images showing that. Here is a fluorescent scan. Um, here's an AFM scan. You see the sizes here of the different uh, exosomes here. We can combine the two images and then we can, we can probe uh, different type of, of uh, <clears throat> surface proteins on the exosomes. Coming to the end of the talk, so what we have tried to answer here, looking at the physics of silicon quantum dots, is to answer the questions I put up in the beginning. Quantum confinement to surface-related emission. Indeed, we see a lot of quantum confined emission. There are other <coughs> ways to prepare silicon nanocrystals, however, where the surface can provide all the luminescence, and then it's more like a chemical compound, let's say. So we had not really investigated that. Spectral tuning from IR2 blue. Yes, I've shown that we can see uh, single nanocrystals, uh, <clears throat> which emit all over the porous silicon spectrum. It might be possible to tune it further, but the green and blue is very difficult. We have been able to show that the line width is really narrow when you look at the single nanocrystal. Direct band gap, no. It's quasi-direct. Some authors have claimed that they see a direct band gap, but it's usually for very small nanocrystals, which is, has also some kind of, of, of surface passivation, which is different to, to what we, we have looked at. <clears throat> Quantum efficiency can be really high, um, <clears throat> so that's the good news. Um, or, uh, high excitations are difficult because of the or shear, but <clears throat> um, what has been observed quite recently, we found this uh, publication in last year that really they have been able to make uh, uh, lasers based on silicon nanocrystals. And you see here a gain spectrum that they published. <clears throat> and what you see here are spectra which uh, clearly show uh, line narrowing. So it's lacing on, on uh, one wavelength. Um, <clears throat> and a key process here was actually a very high pressure hydrogen passivation at 200 centigrade for 240 hours. So this comes back to what I showed in the beginning, that you get a very nice hydrogen passivation after uh, electrochemical etching, for instance. And maybe this can still be done in the oxide by a, a high-pressure oxidation. And then they, they claim that they have quantum, uh, quantum yields that are higher than 50% in these samples, which is really what you need to... to uh, obtain uh, population inversion and lazy. So with that, I'd like to finish. And <clears throat> these are funding that have been granted to us. Thank you very much for that. And yes, thank you for your attention and for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Lynn Ross, for your talk. Very interesting, very constructive, um, uh, the way you presented your, your setup and, and your research. Uh, we'll now have uh, literally a couple of minutes to take some, some questions. Um, so there's one here on how sensitive to temperature is the emission of your quantum dots? Okay. Um... Well, 
as, as for any quantum dot, you see uh, the highest emission at, at low temperatures, but, but uh, indeed there is still luminescence at, at high temperatures. And with the proper preservation, one can possibly reach uh, very high uh, quantum efficiency. But the, the oxide covered that typically result when we have, have been doing it by, by plasma etching and oxidation, those typically have like 20 or 30% efficiency quantum yield at room temperature. So they are not bad, but, uh, but the, the ones in, in hydrogen passivated in toluene can be much higher and we measured up to 70%. Okay, great. But, but Clearly, at low temperatures, much of the uh, non radiative re recommendation goes away. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. Just a reminder for the audience, be sure to type your questions and we will take them on and pass them on to Professor Lynn Ross for, uh, for future um, uh, um, answers. So, um, Again, thank you for your time. Thank you for being on this uh, presentation. Uh, we appreciate you being there. A recording of this webinar will be available in uh, the Learning Center on the Andor website from next week. Uh, be sure to check the web website and get in touch if you have further questions. So thanks again for joining us today. Uh, please enjoy the other presentations um, at, uh, uh, that are, remain uh, tonight and tomorrow. And again, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lynn Ross, for your time uh, for this event. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. <clears throat>